The discovery of these living beings in unimaginable conditions has had repercussions among those searching for the presence of life in space. If life here was possible in conditions that were different from what we enjoy today, why couldn't the same thing happen on other planets? Geologists, biologists, chemists, and astrophysicists have come together in a new scientific field, astrobiology. They have established new expectations about what type of life to search for and where to look for it. What we have successfully achieved is a collaboration of geologists and planetary astrophysicists and the people dedicated to the original evolutionary chemistry of our Earth. In this way, geologists give us a guideline, for example, as to how the planet has evolved into a physical body. At the same time, they join with planetary astrophysicists who explain how the Earth was formed and how this formation is the result of the evolution of the universe itself. On the other hand, the people who study evolutionary chemistry, complex molecules that evolve, enrich the knowledge of the geologists about what existed on the original Earth, the primitive Earth. All these related sciences of astrobiology are drawn from a basic idea, the appearance of life as a natural phenomenon, as the inevitable consequence of a universe in continual change and evolution. In the short to middle term, astrobiology is searching to contrast the idea that life is a cosmic imperative by applying the scientific method to it. The scientific method that is based on everything we know, from how a mobile phone works to how bridges built or how to launch a spacecraft into outer space. This scientific method requires more than one example of a specific phenomenon. Life on Earth as we know it has extraordinary biodiversity, a biodiversity that is manifested in millions of different species on Earth. All of these forms of life, however, are based on certain unique principles, so that the phenomenon of life, as we know it on Earth, is the manifestation of a unique phenomenon. Therefore, the scientific method cannot be directly applied. As a result, we have to go to other places in order to contrast whether life exists or has existed. In 1975, the direct search for life in the solar system began when NASA sent the Viking spacecrafts aloft with Mars as their destination. Today, the red planet is very cold, with average temperatures of minus 53 degrees Celsius, which has frozen the water that at some point covered its surface. It is dominated by a current geological relief of deep craters and dusty dunes, which gives it the appearance of a rocky desert. On the other hand, the absence of an ozone layer subjects Mars to relentless ultraviolet solar radiation. In this dead land, it would seem impossible to find life. The results of the tests carried out by the Viking mission confirmed this hypothesis, and the scientific interest in Mars was set aside. Studies of extremophiles on Earth, however, have put Mars back in the game. For scientists, the absence of signs of life in the two places where the Viking spacecrafts took samples is not final proof. They have to search other parts of the planet with milder environments and investigate the possibility that life manifested itself there in the past. Well, I think, to me, the fact that we're seeing that life exists in these very extreme environments on Earth gives us optimism that we'll find life other places because uh, we know, for example, on Mars that there is liquid water at times. We know that there's ice. Uh, we know that there are very dry regions. Uh, there are probably very salty regions, too. And so it seems to me that uh, the fact that we find life existing on Earth in these extreme environments 
uh, means that we don't know yet the limits. Every year the limits increase in terms of our discoveries. So why not broaden the limits a bit more to, to the environments of some of the planets? I think Mars is the planet of greatest interest for astrobiological uh, exploration. First, because it's nearby and therefore is, is fairly easy to explore, or at least relatively easy to explore. And second, because although today Mars is a very forbidding planet, low temperatures, uh, very little atmosphere, uh, tectonically it appears to be almost dead at least. At the time that life emerged on Earth, Mars was a planet much, like, much more like our own, perhaps not identical, but much more. It had active volcanism, it had a thicker atmosphere, um, at least episodically it had liquid water. And so therefore, Mars is a good candidate to ask the question directly, did life appear more than once? And if it did appear on Mars, the way we will recognize it is, in general, the same way that we recognize evidence of ancient life on Earth, through microfossils, through the influence of microbial communities on sediments, and through chemical signatures that they impart to rocks. Nineteen eighty four. A scientific expedition goes to the Antarctic to collect samples of meteorites. The solitude and the conditions of the frozen continent have kept them intact. Here they discovered a rock that became a key piece in the investigation of Mars. It weighs almost two kilograms and is known as ALH. In 1996, at NASA, David McKay and his team presented it to the public as a Martian meteorite with possible fossil evidence of certain living beings. Since then, the aerolite, alongside others that had been previously collected, have triggered a debate within the scientific community on whether or not we are standing before the definitive evidence that Mars also bore life. We've been studying the, the ALH meteorite for a long time now. We're also looking at other Mars meteorites. There are now 18 different Mars meteorites, and we've looked in detail at about four of them. And we have found what we believe to be signs of life in all four meteorites that we have studied. First ALH, then, then Nokla, which fell in Egypt in 1911. And then Shirgadi, which fell in India, and then Lafayette, which was recovered in Indiana, USA. Uh, we think we see evidence for life. We have to prove it. We haven't proved it yet to the satisfaction of the scientific community, but we're working on that. Uh, how long will that take? Uh, possibly a few more years. We hope that we can do that either prove it or disprove it within, say, three or four more years. And that's what we're, we're working on. Through the study of meteorites and through new explorations, scientists hope to decipher the Martian enigmas in the period of just one decade. The European Space Agency is also participating in the race with the Mars Express, which will be launched in 2004. It is a satellite that will be placed in orbit around Mars and which has a landing module. Both devices will carry out in-depth studies of the planet and with the images obtained, precise maps of the territory will be drawn up. Since the American Viking missions in the 1970s, there has not been another mission with such a central astrobiological focus in its investigations as the Mars Express. And furthermore, this spacecraft has a landing vehicle, the Beagle 2, with a series of instruments to analyze the chemistry and organic substances of the planet, such as the rock minerals and the surface of Mars. 
It can also take images of the surface and measure the composition of the atmosphere around the landing area. It even has instruments able to reach a depth of between one and one and a half meters in order to analyze the subsoil, which has not been affected by ultraviolet radiation, and where indications of life may be preserved better than on the surface.